recessions in the past 20 years that we haven't. And yet most media is still reporting the American economy as if we were part of it. The, everything is related, but the American and European impact on Australia is filtered through Asia. And Asia is already changing. Beijing, I've got more faith in Beijing's economic management than that of Washington or London or Tokyo. Uh, a decade ago, nearly 40% of China's exports went to the US. Now it's less than 20%. They've been purposefully diversifying and in their five-year plan there's a clear statement of flicking the switch to more domestic consumption and less, uh, less export dependency. They're doing it because they know they have to and they can do it. Along the way, um, amazing things are happening. You've got to remember about China that it is the middle kingdom. It is the centre of the universe. Always has been, always will be. Uh, it was always the world's great economic power except for a little glitch in history of 170 years which is being set right. According to the IMF, China overtakes the US economy in 2016 on a purchasing power parity basis. And the Americans just can't accept that. There's a whole industry devoted to trying to knock the China story. Um, and there are examples of what that means. In 1998, for every one car sold in China, there were 10 sold in the US. Now there are more cars sold in China. Uh, three years ago, there were 649 kilometres of high-speed rail in China. That's 649 more kilometres than Australia has. Um, now there's 8,400 kilometres of it, and in three years' time, they'll have 19,000. That's just the high-speed stuff. Because you can't be the world's dominant economic power if you still have half your people, subsistence, peasants down on the farm. You've got to urbanise and industrialise. Now, I've been hot on the China story for a long time. As a young journalist, I, I went to Hong Kong in the late 70s because that was as close as you could get to China then. And I've got a nephew who's got a, a legal firm there. And, you know, I tried to stay on top of it. And I, I thought I was pretty hot on it for a long time. And I met a bloke last year who said, no, you haven't got the China story at all. Michael Power, the chief strategist at Investec. He said, to use the car example, um, sure, they sell more cars in China now than they do in the US. You don't begin to get the China story until you realise that despite that, vehicle penetration of the Chinese market is 3%. 80% of people buying a car in China are buying their first ever car, and 90% of them are paying cash. What that means is you are talking about an untapped, ungeared market that is just exponentially large. Then you begin to get the China story. I thought he was right. But I had a comeback. And that is that something I realised many years ago, that the most powerful economic driver on earth is a mother's desire to see her child have a better chance in life than she had. And that driver has been unleashed for another couple of billion people just in China and India over the last two decades as they've joined the open economy, the Western economy, and that that potential to get ahead is there when it wasn't for one reason or another. And once you unleash that power, you don't shut the door again. You can't. You still have booms and busts and stupidities and wars and plagues and whatever, but that fundamental driver is in place. Um, you know, part of the industry devoted to knocking China sort of says, oh, look, they all depend upon the Western consumer, which is not true. Um, th they give that, that impression that, uh, you know, it's all someone else's job. It's not. And Phil Lowe, the head of economics at the Reserve Bank in a very important speech pointed out that you've got to remember that America's great surge of wealth came from domestic consumption. The US after World War II, its great surge of wealth was built on domestic consumption. And if America could do that with a couple of hundred million people, what can Asia do with three and a half billion people as long as they adopt the right policies? And that is what we are all part of. That is our economy. At the most obvious level, um, it shows up in, in facts. I, I'll just quickly do this because I love this, this particular graph. I saw it from BHP Instagram results two and a half years ago. Um, they were very sombre results at the time because they had to confess blowing a few billion dollars of shareholders' funds on dud projects. They had one important graph, China's urban residential floor space. And I know each and every one of you, when you wake up in the morning, the first thing you think is, geez, how's China's urban residential floor space going today? Worry no more, here it is. According to BHP and McKinsey's, in the year 2000, China had 9 billion square metres of urban residential floor space. I don't know what it looks like, a billion square metres, I think it's big. 2008, they doubled it. In 
terms of housing people, they were building Brisbane every couple of weeks. Okay, in a bad fortnight, they might build Adelaide, but we did that once. Um, <laughs> sorry, probably South Australians here, I forgot. Uh, anyway, that's a commodities boom. That's a lot of housing. That's moving 300, 400 million people, part of moving 300 million people into the cities over the past couple of decades. BHP two years ago thought, oh look, it can't continue to grow at that rate. And it'll slow down to maybe six billion more square metres. And BHP was wrong. This is from the Economist Intelligence Unit, the more recent figures. And as you can see, the rate of building has actually picked up in China from 2008. Now running up above 1.8 billion square metres a year. The neat thing about this graph is that the bars running down represent the total floor space of European countries. You know, the big ones, the Germans, the French, the Italians, little guys down there, the Portuguese, Swedes, Czechs. As you can see, you can kind of neatly cut off the excess here and fill in underneath there. And what it means is that China has built Europe in the past 15 years. And they're about to do it again. Because they have to. You have to urbanise and industrialise. And it's not just China. It's the rest of the emerging markets as well. India is out there 17 or so years behind China. India has not begun to exploit cheap labour yet. Um, I'll move along, otherwise I get bogged down. The result of that is obviously the commodities boom, which is why this is the only evidence of a downsizing of the Australian mining industry during the kerfuffle over the resources rent tax. Because while the CEOs were in Canberra jumping up and down saying, this is appalling, we're all going to move to Mogadishu, it's so nice doing business there. <coughs> The CFOs were quietly telling the ABS the truth, and that is that they're investing with their ears pinned back. This is the budget's projection of mining income. We'll be getting $200 billion in mining income in 12-13. That's probably understated. And the amazing thing about it is what we are putting into the ground to get that stuff out. This was the budget projection. They were expecting uh, mining investment, resources investment, capital expenditure of $76.4 billion, and they were wrong. We'll get an update on CapEx next Thursday. Uh, the last quarterly update had uh, this resources investment running at $84 billion this financial year. If we were getting $84 billion out of the ground a little while ago, we would have thought it was damn good. Now we're putting $84 billion into the ground to get stuff out. If you combine, if, if you can accept the impact of those hundreds of billions of dollars being pushed into this economy by the terms of trade, plus the scores of billions in capex, okay, you may not be copying it in the first round, but it does get spread around through the taxation system, through the services to the resources industry and the services to the research services of the resources industry, let alone the phenomena of fly in, fly out. But it's more to it than that, much more. Because this is the opportunity. This is not the end game. You know, I listened to the two speakers before me, the minister, you know, oh, yep, we need jobs and training for the resources boom. Yep, we sure do. And I'm not going to tell anyone here how to suck eggs on that. It's obvious. We know it. But we need so much more investment in education and training in this window of opportunity of restructuring to have something to show for it afterwards. 